Okay, we're back at AWS reInvent 2021. You're watching theCUBE. My name is Dave Vellante, and we're here with Jay Theodore, who's the CTO of Enterprise and AI at Esri, and he's joined by Dave Cardella, who's the Principal Product Manager for Developer Technologies, also at Esri. Guys, thanks for coming on. Welcome to theCUBE. Thanks, Thanks, Dave. Dave. Jay, maybe you could give us a little background on Esri. What do you guys do? What are you all about? Sure, um, Esri is an old timer. We are a 50 year old uh, software company. Uh, we are the pioneers in GIS and the world leader in GIS, geographic information system. Um, we build a geospatial infrastructure uh, that's built for the cloud, built for the edge, uh, built for the field also, you can say. Uh, so we do mapping and analytics, we help our customers solve very complex challenges by bringing uh, location intelligence into the mix. Our customers sort of like run the world, transform the world, and we sort of like empower them with the technology we have. Uh, so that's what we do. The original edge, now of course AWS is coming to you. Yes. <laughs> Who are your customers, your main customers? You can maybe share that. Yeah, we've got, uh, we've got over 350,000 uh, customers in, uh, <laughs> yeah. We're Scale. All, uh, yeah, <laughs> in the public sector especially, um, uh, commercial businesses, nonprofit organizations, and, and that really represents um, tens of millions of users uh, globally. So, Let's talk a little bit more about how things are changing. Um, as I say, the edge is coming to you. Maybe AI, you know, 50 years ago. Actually, 50 years ago, there was probably a lot of talk about AI. When I came into the business, you know, there was a lot of chatter about it. But now it's real. All this data that we have and the compute power, the cost has come down. So AI's in your title. You know, yes. Um, tell us more about that. I think AI has come to edge. Uh, when I went to uh, grad school, AI was still in theory because we didn't have the compute and of course we didn't have all the data that was collected, right? Uh, now there's a lot of observation data coming in through IoT and many sensors and so on. So what do you do with that? Like human interpretation is pretty challenged, I would say. So that's why AI come in, comes in to augment the intelligence that we have in terms of extracting information. So geospatial AI specifically, which we focus on, is to try to take location that's embedded with this kind of information and sort of like extract knowledge and information out of them, right? Intelligence out of them. So that's what we focus on, to complement location intelligence with AI, which we call geospatial AI. So you can observe how things are changing, maybe report on that, I mean, that's got to be a huge thing that we can talk about. So maybe talk about some of the, the big trends that are driving your business, what are those? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So, um, I was listening to Sandy Carter's keynote yesterday and she really emphasized the importance of data. And uh, data is crucial to what we do as a technology company. And we curate data globally and we get our data from best of breed sources. Uh, and that, that includes uh, commercial data providers, it includes national mapping agencies, and also a community maps program where we get data from our customers, from our global network of distributors and partners, and we take that data, we curate it, we host it, and we deliver it, we deliver it back. And so, uh, just recently, for example, we're really excited because we released the 2020 uh, global land cover. And so Esri is the first company to release this data at 10 meter resolution for the entire planet, and it's made up of uh, well over 400,000 Earth observations from various, uh, various satellites. So, you know, data is, uh, it's not only a nice to have anymore, it's actually, it's actually a must have, and so, so is location when we talk about data, they go hand in hand. 10 meters, so I can look at the hole in the, the, the roof of my barn, well, uh... <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Depends on what you're trying to do, right? <laughs> so I think, you know, to uh, talk about it, it has, it's a within context. GIS is all about context, right? It's bringing location into context in your decision-making process. It's sort of like the where, along with the when, what, how, and why. That's what GIS brings in. So a lot of problems are challenging because we need to bring these things together. It's sort of like, you're tiering various layers of data that you have and then bringing them within context. Very often the context that human minds understand and reflected in the physical world is geographic location, right? So that's what you bring in. And I would say that there's various kinds of data also. Various types of data, formats of data, structured data, unstructured data. Data captured from uh, extraterrestrial, you know, like you could say satellite imagery, 
from drones, from IoT. So it's like on the ground, above the ground, under the ground. All these sensors are bringing in data, right? So what GIS does is try to map that data to a place on the earth. At very high precision, if you're looking at it locally, or at a certain precision if it's regionally, trying to find patterns, trying to understand what's emerging. And then as you take this and infuse geospatial AI into this, you can even predict what is going to happen based on the past. So that's sort of like, you could say, GIS being used for real world problems. Like if you take some examples, COVID, uh, the pandemic is one example. Being able to first discover where it happened, where it's spreading, you know, that's the tracking aspect. And then how you respond to that. And then how you recover, you know, recovering as humans, as businesses, and so on. So we have widespread use of that. Uh, the most popular would be the John Hopkins uh, dashboard course, yeah. that everyone's we seen. It's thing. got a trillions of hits and so on, right? That's one example. Another example is addressing racial equity by using location information, similarly social justice. You know, these are all problems that we face today, right? So GIS is extensively used by our customers to solve such problems. And then of course you have the climate change challenge itself, right? Where you're overlaying all kinds of complex data that we can't comprehend because you have to go back decades and try to bring all that together to compute. So all of this together comes in the form of a geospatial cloud that we have as an offering. So, okay, that's, that's amazing. I mean, you're building a super cloud, we call it. Uh, you know, and, and so how do you deal with, how do you work with AWS? What's the relationship there? Where do developers fit in? Maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So we've got uh, two main um, integration points with AWS. A lot of our uh, location services uh, that we expose data and capabilities through are built on AWS. So we use uh, storage, uh, we use cloud caching in various, uh, in AWS's various data sets across the world uh, quite heavily. So that's, that's one integration point. Uh, the other is uh, a relatively new product that uh, Amazon has released called Amazon Location Service. And so what it does is it brings location and spatial intelligence directly into a developer's AWS dashboard. So the experience that they're already used to, they now get the power of Esri services and location intelligence right at their fingertips. So you're, you're talking about, we started talking about the edge. Your, your data architecture is very distributed, right? But you're, of course you're, you're bringing it back. So how, how does that all work? Do you, you processing locally and then sending some data back? You sending all data back? What, what does that flow look like? I, I think the key thing is that our customers work with data of all kinds, all formats, all sizes, and some are in real time, some are big data and archive, right? So most recently, just to illustrate that point, um, this year we released ArcGIS Enterprise on Kubernetes. It's the entire geospatial cloud made available for enterprise customers, and that's made available on AWS, on EKS. Now when it's available on EKS, that means all these capabilities are microservices, so they can be massively scaled, they're DevOps friendly, and you've got the full mapping and analytics system that's made available for this. And we sort of like built it, you know, cloud native from the ground up. And the more important thing that we have now is connectivity redshift. Why is that important? Because a lot of our customers have geospatial data in these cloud data warehouses. Redshift is very important for them. And so you can connect to that, you can discover these massive petabytes of data sets, and then you can set up what we call a query layer. It's basically pushing analytics into Redshift and being able to bring out that data for mapping, visualization, for AI workflows and so on. It's pretty amazing and it's pretty exciting at this time. And, I mean, you so much data. And then, and then, what do you tear it down into a glacier of just to save some cost or does it kind of all stay in S3 or is it? So we already work with S3, we work with RDS, we support Amazon, Aurora, our customers are very happy with that. So Redshift is a new offering for us to connect to Redshift. Yeah, okay. So the way the query layer works is, all of your observation data is in Redshift. Your other kinds of data, your authoritative data sets could come from various other sources, including in Amazon Aurora, for example, okay? And then you overlay them and use them. Now, the data in Redshift is usually massive. So when you run the analytic query, we let you cache that as a materialized view or as a snapshot that you can refresh and you can work against that. This is really good because it complements our ability to actually take that data, to put it in a map image, 
which we render server-side. It's got very complex cartographic uh, ready symbology and rendering and everything in there. And you get these beautiful rendering of maps that you, comes out of Redshift data. And, and you're, you're pushing AI throughout your stack, is that? Yeah, AI is just like infused, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, I would say, human intelligence augmented for data scientists for everyone. You know, whether you're using it through notebooks or whether you're using it through applications that we have or the developer APIs themselves. So what are some of the big initiatives you're working on near term, mid term? Yeah, so you, you mentioned what's really driving uh, innovation and um, it's related to the question that you just asked right now and uh, I really believe developers drive innovation. They're force multipliers in the solutions that they, that they build. And so that's really the integration point that Esri has with AWS, it's developers. And earlier this year, we released uh, ArcGIS Platform, which is our platform as a service offering that exposes these powerful location services that Jay just explained as a set of on-demand services that developers can bring in their applications as they want, and they can bring in one, they can bring in two or three, whatever they need, but they're there when they need them. And uh, also, uh, developers have their client API of choice. So we, we have our own client APIs that we offer, but you're not, you're not pigeonholed into that when you're, when you're working with ArcGIS platform. Developer can bring their own API. Okay, so you call the platform as a service. Are you, are you, so you make the, are you making your data available as well? Your data, your tooling, and then selling that as a service? The, our, our, our data has always been available yeah. as a service, I would say. Okay, yeah. Everything that we do, our GIS tools, are accessible as a web service. Is our that new? Or no, that's, 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 that's always, always been, the been there. Yeah, that's okay. always been that way. The difference now is, everything is built from the ground up to be cloud native. Okay. From the ground up to be connected to every data set that's available on AWS, every compute that can be exploited from small to massive in terms of compute, and also reaching out to bring all the apps and the developer experiences, pushing out to customers. So 50 years ago, you weren't obviously using the cloud, uh, but, but so you were running everything on-prem, now you're all in the cloud, or you kind of got a mix, what is the so data picture? We, you, we have two major offerings. There's RTS Online, where obviously it's software as a service, and it's GIS as a service provided for everyone, and that's available everywhere. The other offering we have is RTS Enterprise, where some customers run it on-premises, some run it in the cloud, especially AWS. Many run it on the edge, some in the field, and there's connectivity between this. A lot of our customers are hybrid, so they make the best of both, depending on the kinds of data, the kinds of workflows, giving them the choice, exactly. And I would say, you know, taking Werner's uh, keynote this morning, he talked about what's the next frontier, right? The next frontier, could very well be when AWS gets to space and makes compute available there, it's sitting alongside the data that's captured, and we've always, like I said, for 50 years, worked with satellite imagery, yeah. or worked with IoT, or worked with drone data. It's just getting GIS closer to where the data it's the is. the ultimate edge, space. Yes. All right, I'll give you guys a wrap, give us a quick wrap, if you would. Final <laughs> thoughts. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, uh, I, I really resonate with, with data and content. We're a technology company, there's no doubt about that. But without good data, not only supplied by ourselves, but our customers, Jay, Jay mentioned it earlier, our customers bring their own data to our platform, and that's really what drives the analytics and the accuracy in the answers to the, to the problems that people are trying Bring to solve. Bring their first party data with your data and then one plus one is... Yes. Yeah, and the <laughs> key thing about that is not some of the data, it's all of the data that you have. You don't more need to be constrained. Yeah, you're not sampling. Yes, <laughs> right. exactly. All right guys, thanks so much. Really interesting story. Congratulations. Thank you, Dave. Thanks, Great Dave. All right, thank you for watching. This is Dave Vellante for theCUBE, the leader in global tech coverage. We'll be right back.